Why is it that anything I set out to do often takes so much longer than I initially expect? In my last video, I started designing and machining my own surface gauge, and had high expectations of completing that project rather quickly. I spent the better part of a week working on it, but came nowhere close to actually finishing. Two out of the total 21 parts may not seem like good progress, but they were pretty complicated designs. Almost all of the remaining parts are made on the lathe, which is my favorite machine and I'm much quicker at using. There's just one little thing I need to address before I can get started. To get right to the heart of my problem, the static phase converter I'm using to create three phase electricity for my lathe simply isn't doing what I need it to. Turns out this type of phase converter only creates three phases for a couple of seconds to get the motor running. Then the machine lugs along on one phase, and is only getting about half the power. That means under normal operation, I'm constantly tripping the motor protector, and then waiting around for it to reset which really doesn't help with the whole time underestimation problem. To fix this, I need continuous three-phase electricity. That's where the VFD comes in. Fair warning, I'm neither an electrical engineer nor an electrician, but I'm pretty good at figuring it out as I go. At least that's what I tell myself. I have a lot of machining to do, so my goal is to have the simplest and quickest integration I can. First, I need to mount this somewhere. I definitely don't have room in the existing control panel, and I'm not fond of mounting this on the backsplash. So the only place left is the wall. The instructions say not to mount this on any combustible surfaces, so I'll use this old metal shelf to space it off the wood. The manual isn't very clear if this needs a separate control power, so the simple way to figure this out is to wire it up and see. That answers that question. Now the output terminals, which I'll connect right to the original lathe power cable. At this point, I've not modified anything in the existing control circuit. The work light is getting power, which is promising, but of course the motor doesn't start. Not exactly surprising, since we haven't configured any of the VFD parameters yet. There are hundreds of parameters, but since I'm only using this to get three-phase power, I'm just setting up the ones relevant for my application. To see if this is actually working, I'm manually overriding the motor contactor and pressing the run key. Success! I'd like to be able to still use the lever switch on the carriage to turn the lathe on like normal, so I need some way to get signals between the lathe and the VFD. The VFD already has terminals for these input signals, so I just need something on the lathe side. After some poking around, I discovered that each of the motor contactors have unused auxiliary contacts that I can piggyback off of. But there's one small problem. I'm going to need another power source. The current control circuit is 110 volts and this power comes from a transformer. But I can simply bypass the transformer part and connect my own 110 volt power, leaving the rest of the circuit intact. Then connect my inputs to the extra contacts and... Bingo! The only thing left to do is tidy up the wiring. And with that, I think I'll call it a night and start fresh with some machining tomorrow. Just kidding. It's never that simple. After some more consideration and talking to fellow machinist YouTuber Burton Zadek, I discovered a very large and dangerous error in my setup. By electrical code, you can't have any form of break in the circuit between a VFD and a motor. And right now I have a disconnect, a motor contactor, and a motor protector. Bad, Brandon. Fortunately, the solution is quite simple. I can bypass all the control circuitry and just use the switches in the lathe to trigger the VFD. That means I won't be needing all these old controls components, so out they come. With those out of the way, I have just enough ventilation clearance to mount the VFD in here. Now we just wire everything up and see if it works. And it does. I'm already liking this much better. The VFD being mounted in the panel makes the wiring so much tidier, and in general the machine seems a lot quieter running on true three-phase power. Even though this took most of a weekend to sort out, I think it was time well spent. 
and I'm already considering similar modifications for the other machines. But those will have to wait. We have a project to finish. With 19 parts still to make, we're going to have to start knocking these out at a rapid pace. I'm anxious to see how the fine adjust arm will pivot in the base, so we'll start with the pivot screws. Yes, that is a bolt I'm turning down to make a smaller screw. The easy way would be to use something already threaded for this, but I just can't bring myself to take the shortcut. This blank I've turned down is long enough for both screws that I need to make. But before I cut the threads, I'm going to slit each end for a screwdriver. To do this, I'm using a slitting saw. This is a new tool for my shop, and I've never actually used one before. So let's give this a go. The run out on the blade had me a little concerned, but the slit seems to have come out just fine. Back on the lathe to cut the threads. I'm only partially threading this now while I have a short stick out. This will let me turn down a detail for a locking set screw I'll make later. After doing this to both ends, I can finish cutting the threads for the longer screw. I'm not sure why, but those threads didn't come out even remotely straight. And of course this jams up about halfway into the block. I'm sure there's something I did wrong here. But I'll just start over and use a technique I know, and single point turn the threads first. Alright, I might have been a little over ambitious with the depth of cut there. Let's try that one more time with lighter passes. That's looking much better. We should be getting pretty close, so let's see how a nut feels on here. Hmm, something doesn't seem quite right. Ah, that would be the issue. I'm 25 thou oversized. This dummy forgot how to read a micrometer. I think it's time to call it a night. With a fresh set of brain cells the next day, I can take another stab at this. I'm triple checking the diameter before I start cutting and only taking a couple thou off at a time. But right when I start to get close, it snags again. I'm not giving up hope just yet, but I clearly need a break from this part of the project. Let's work on something simpler, like these straight pins. They're very basic with only one critical feature. They have to be a friction fit with the reamed holes we put in the block. Turning these down to a tooth howl oversize gives me the material to not only smooth out the cutting ridges, but also to very gradually approach the tight tolerance I need. When I get close, I trade measuring for simply checking the fit with the block until I'm happy. Then part it off and make three more. Last step is to clean up the other ends. And while we're here, file a nice round on each end and sand them smooth. After two days of machining, I have a whole four parts to show for it. Feeling a bit rejuvenated by my success with the pins, I'm excited to start machining with some of my favorite material, brass. There are three knobs to make, and I think I can manage them all out of this one setup. Some of the coming operations will be pretty high load, so we'll center drill the end for tailstock support. Then turn down the length. Maybe that isn't the best place for the camera. That's better. This is why turning brass is so fun. It just cuts like butter, and the surface finish always comes out beautifully. We'll make the smaller knob for the fine adjust screw first. With the end turned down to the smaller knob diameter, we can switch to the knurling tool. Except there isn't quite enough room. Let me fix that real quick. This is one of those high load operations that the tailstock support helps out greatly. Nice and grippy, just how I like it. Now I've had an idea for a small detail on this face, so let's see how that looks. Oh, I really like that. I think I'll do this on the big knobs too. This knob will be press fit onto a partially threaded pin we'll make later. So I'll drill and ream a hole in preparation for that. The next operation is a small radius on the inboard side. I have a similar detail on the other two knobs as well, so let's make a form tool to cut all three. This is a completely decorative feature, so grinding this by hand will be accurate enough for me. Mounted in a tool holder, I'm adjusting the height using the point of a live center as a reference. Then I can straighten everything back out and cut the profile. And finally cut the knob off to length. That turned out great. Up next are the two larger knobs. First we need to reface and center drill the end for the tailstock support we'll need for knurling. And I'll go ahead and knurl enough for both knobs rather than do them individually. 
The starting diameter has an impact on the pitch of the resulting neural, so the pitch on these knobs didn't come out quite the same as the smaller knob like I'd hoped. But I'll live. Now to reduce the diameter around the threaded end of the knob. I'm leaving about 10 thou on the left side. When I switch to the form tool I can then clean this up and take it to depth at the same time, giving a seamless transition. I don't want the threads to poke through the other side of the knob, so I'll start this with a standard tap, then switch to a bottoming tap to maximize the number of threads available in the hole. Now we can part this off, rinse, and repeat. That was easy, or at least it appeared that way if we conveniently ignore the fact that I foobarred one of the knobs. Moving right along. We still need to clean up the other side of the knob, so let's switch back to the collet chuck. Since we removed so much material from the center of the part, I'm taking these cuts very gently. I'd prefer not to have to make yet another one. Like on the fine adjust knob, I'm adding this totally useless but very pretty detail on the end here. And that concludes this segment of brass turning fun. But don't worry, we've still got a lot of cool stuff to make. The knobs thread onto spindles, but before we can make those, we need to make the sleeves that go around the spindles. Step one is turning some stock to diameter. And of course we have to sand those tool marks away. Over on the mill we can drill the cross hole. The collet blocks we made a while back are perfect for this, even if they are a bit out of spec. But just for peace of mind, I'm checking the alignment with an indicator. Not so bad after all. This cross hole needs to be aligned as close as possible to the center, so it will line up with the cross hole we'll drill in the spindle later. Now back to the lathe to drill and ream the ID. In both of these reaming operations, I'm pre-drilling about 15 thou undersized to give a good chip and a nice finish. After parting this off a few thou long, we can flip it around, face it to length, and sand it smooth. Then copy and paste. That was pretty easy. So let's try something a little more challenging. Like the arm rod. But I am going to make it a bit shorter than the original design for several reasons. One, because 12 inches just seems excessive. And two, because trying to hold a half thou tolerance over such a long and unsupported length will be difficult. This first cut should be a good test. That's not very promising. Right around the middle, the vibrations get pretty bad, and you can see the effect on the part. This clearly isn't going to work, but I do have one trick up my sleeve. A follower rest. It rests against the material, giving support against deflection, and it also follows the cutting tool since it's mounted to the lathe carriage. Now I should point out that I'm fairly inexperienced with this tool, and by that I mean I've never used one before, ever. But I gather that I need the rest to contact the material just behind where the cutting tool is working. That surface is looking a lot better, and the diameter is actually consistent within a couple thou across the part. This isn't quite the tolerance I need, but I expected to be doing some sanding anyways. After clearing all the ridges, I can get an idea of the larger areas and focus on those. Then start making smaller and smaller adjustments until the sleeves slide on nicely across the whole length. Now we can clean up our mess and part this to length. One end of this rod needs a ball feature, so let's make another form tool to do this. Back on the lathe, we can set up for the first cut using the live center for support. I'll have to do this in two passes. First from this angle, I'll go just far enough to clear the original OD. Then I can reposition closer to the chuck and angle the form tool to cut the remainder of the ball. Even though I said this didn't need to be perfectly spherical, I'm still impressed with how that turned out. Last job on this part is to cut it to length. Of course this isn't even remotely important, but I happen to have a caliper large enough to measure this, so I'm going to use it. Looks like I'm about 412 thou long. No chance that offcut will be of any use, so we'll just turn it into chips. Now that the arm rod and sleeves are finished, let's make the parts that hold them together. The spindles. Naturally, we'll start by turning down some stock, and sanding it to size for a perfect fit with the sleeves. I'll be able to economize my setups by making the two spindles from each end of this stock. We'll start with the threads. This stick out isn't ideal, but rather than mess around with the tail stock, we'll just take very light passes. One of the biggest advantages of single point turning is the ability to fine tune the thread clearance to the mating part. 
in this case the brass knobs we turned earlier. Before we flip this around, we'll also turn down and polish this shoulder. Over on the mill, the collet block makes another appearance. Like I mentioned before, the positions of these drilled and reamed holes are pretty critical, so it's important to take our time here. The last bit is to split this in two and finish the end to a nice radius with a file and emery cloth. To attach the arm to the fine adjust lever, the only thing we need now is a spacer washer. So let's whip one up real quick. I'm not quite up for the pivot screws just yet, so let's depart from the lathe for a bit and make the indicator clamp. We'll start by cutting off some stock a bit larger than we will ultimately need. This will give me material to hold on to while I mill this relatively small part into its final shape. The sawn faces aren't even remotely straight, so I'll first mill these flat and square. And also take these four sides to dimension. The ends aren't square either, so I skimmed these as well to use as references for locating the mounting holes. The first mounting hole will be drilled and reamed to suit the spindle. The second hole is 90 degrees from the first, but before I reposition the material, I'll put this vise stop against the back end. This will save me from having to re-indicate on the part. This hole will be a snug fit for the standard 3 8 stub of a dial indicator. To cut the radii around the mounting holes, I'll shift over to one of my new favorite tools, the rotary table. Before mounting anything, I first need to use the coax indicator to find the center of this table, then zero the DRO. In my last video, we made this positioning pin to hold the fine adjust lever. And it just so happens that it's a perfect fit for this part as well. The excess material on this end comes in handy for securing this part with hold down clamps. To cut the radius around this end of the part, we'll need to travel 180 degrees, but I need to know what angle to start at. Using the dial indicator, I can tram the side of the block to the mill and zero the dial on the hand wheel of the rotary table. I left this dimension of the material a few thou wider than the final width so I can mill the radius and the sides in the same setup. A sacrificial aluminum plate underneath saves the surface of the rotary table from any damage. The slitting saw makes another appearance to cut the clamping relief. Unfortunately, the cutting blade was slightly bowed by the arbor, so the slit drifted a bit. But it's... fine. Before cutting the radius around the other side, I need to cut off the rest of the stock. But now that that material is gone, it doesn't leave much to fixture with. So a little creativity is needed. There's really only room for one clamp on the top. But sticking this pin through the cross hole gives me something to hold on to and also prevents rotation. Let's see how it holds up. Piece of cake. This part is technically complete, but I can't resist sanding all the faces. Now that looks on par with the rest of the parts, but how well does it work? Perfect fit and very secure. Now I'd really like to see how all this fits with the base, so I guess I can't put this off any longer. Let's take another stab at the pivot screws. You know what? Hang on a second. During that last failed attempt, I was getting pretty close with the threads before it snagged. Well looky there, it actually does fit the block. And there are just enough good threads for what I need. I can work with this. I need a way to hang on to it though, so I made a quick holding block. With this, I can thread the screw through and lock it in place with a jam nut, giving me something substantial to hold on to. After removing the mangled section, I'll cut the bevel to match the chamfer we put on the pivot hole of the fine adjust lever. The other side then gets face down to length and is filed to a nice radius. Now I'm moving this whole setup over to the mill so I can cut the screwdriver slot. I managed to play with the slitting saw arbor a bit and drew up nearly all the run out so the slot comes out flawlessly this time. I need to turn away a small section of threads near the slotted end. This will give me a nice spot for a set screw to rest without damaging the threads. Let's see how they fit. That actually turned out a lot better than I thought it would. I plan to make these set screws, but I better not push my luck. These standard screws will work just fine. 
I do have one last piece I need to make before I can call this complete though. We already made the fine adjust knob, now we just need the screw. I'm looking to press fit the knob in place so this diameter is roughly 5 thou larger than the hole in the knob. I still have to go a bit smaller for the threaded section, but since the stick out is so severe, the deflection is pretty extreme. To combat this, I'm taking 3-4 to four spring passes before measuring. Despite my poor outcome last time I used a die, I'm going to try it again here. I figure the threads are small enough that any error won't be an issue. The tailstock is perfect for pressing the knob onto the screw. It doesn't take much force at all, and it helps keep the knob square to the axis. Last and final step is to face cut across the brass and steel at the same time to clean up the end. And with that, all the machining is done. I understand now why this is such a common project for machining apprentices. 21 total parts, each with their own unique challenge. And it has the added value of being an extremely useful tool in the end. There are countless ways to use this device, and honestly I couldn't tell you more than a handful myself. But I did have one specific task in mind when I set out to make this. I want to be able to check the squareness of my parts. With the features I've included, I now have three ways of doing this. First by using the ball end of the rod arm like so. Second by using the curved end of the base. And the last one I didn't discover until just a day ago. A ball bearing resting against the chamfers of the arm pocket. Clever. Any one of these three techniques will let me theoretically measure squareness to a ten thousandth over nine inches or so. You might be wondering what project I have in mind that will need that kind of accuracy. And I'll give you a hint. It involves this. And this. As always, thanks for watching and see you next time. Thank you.